morning. Record this. I'm a little nervous because I've been watching them on TV a little bit, actually a lot. <laughs> and um, um, he amazes me. So voted to Forbes 30 on the 30 and Ebony's Power 100. John Henry is a Dominican American entrepreneur and investor. Henry started his first business at 18. That's the age that a lot of you are in here today. And on demand dry clean services for the ent entertainment industry. Later set in the business when he was just 21 years old. That's the other age group. A lot of you are 21 in here today. Um, using this momentum, um, John launched Co Found Harlem, a nonprofit incubator that fosters the tech ecosystem north of 96th Street in New York City. He now serves as a partner at Harlem Capital, a diversity focused early stage venture capital and is also the host of Viceland's Hustle, that TV show I've been watching a lot of, which is focused on helping entrepreneurs grow their businesses. Let's welcome to the stage, John Henry. Check, 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 levels, levels. Check, 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 check. Hey, can you turn my mic up just a little bit? All right. I like to move around, so I hope you guys don't mind. All right, very cool. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I feel like I'm speaking to, you know, a room full of, you know, kids that, like, we all grew up on the same blocks. Like, I grew up, how many of you guys grew up in, say, Washington Heights, which is where I'm from? Did I hear a yer over there? <laughs> Hey, 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 okay. How many from like the boogie down, let's say? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Harlem? Yeah. Yup, yeah. yeah. All right, what else am I missing? Queens? Yeah. Oh, okay. I see you guys. What else we got? What else we got? I'm going to throw out Staten Island just in case. Staten Island? All right, all right, we got a few, we got a few. <laughs> this is great, man. So, you know. A few things come to mind. Um, let me just get just a little additional context. How many of you guys have ever come across even a single piece of my content? Let me see how I'm dealing with young folks. Oh, that's what's up. I uh, appreciate you guys. Uh, okay, cool. So uh, I, I think what I'd like to do is I'm going to share a little bit about my background so we have some context. And then we're going to get into pretty much the future of work, which is what you guys are kind of downloading on. And by the way, I heard your guys' answers were super thoughtful. We were getting deep. Homie was talking about singularity. Uh, we had when robots take over the world, but then some other, some other person said, um, if robots are advancing, then that means humans are evolving. And I think that is 100% on the money. 100% on the money. Because by the way, like most of our ancestors, we were picking cotton. Like, let's just keep it 100. Right? And it wasn't until there were industrial advancements that made it more economically feasible for uh, landowners at that time to go with machines versus having a bunch of people. That's what freed up a bunch of human capital, right? because, because we were no longer uh, needed for those jobs. And, and you know, that's, that's taking it back quite a bit. But there's always technological advancement. The thing is that now we see technology as an iPhone. But in reality, technology is anytime there's a change, an improvement, right? Like, like a hammer was technology at, at one point. Like there were people banging shit with their you know, fists or whatever it was until the hammer came about. And so we've gone on getting better. Um, and consistently, you see folks, people who shy away from the new wave will undoubtedly get left behind. And that's just a fact. Now, the interesting thing about how where kind of we all exist is that like I don't know um, what you your guys parents do for a living for example but my parents work low skill labor jobs in a warehouse in Pennsylvania making not much money and actually on the I get chills thinking about it because on the drive here that's what I'm constantly thinking about I'm like man I know my parents are not well equipped to thrive in this new economy I don't want them to get left behind. 
I try to tell my mom, yo, you want to learn some skills? She's like, muchacho. <laughs> She's like, they had to eso. She's like, my investment was raising you guys. And so in addition to the fact that the landscape is changing, we in this room are going to face an additional complexity because we're going to have to be thinking of our, of our mom and pops. And by the way, I've realized as I've gone into rooms that are a little bit more affluent, it is very much a thing for you know, folks like, like us that come from our hoods, like we over index about caring for our parents. We just do. Like, I've noticed, I thought that shit was like normal and common, but like when you step into other neighborhoods, people are like, ah, you know, my mom, they'll be fine. Why? Because the majority of someone's net worth in this country historically has been tied to owning a primary residence. And black and Latinos disproportionately do not own your primary residence. So what happens when your parents start hitting my parents' age, 60, 65, and you've got no asset to fall back on because my parents never owned anything in this country? And so whereas typically you would sell your home, and I used to think you were rich if you had a home to sell, now I understand middle class is in the same boat we are, and that's just facts. But, but at least when you have a home to sell, you have a little bit of a cushion and your parents can have a little bit of funds to get through to retirement. But what happens when your parents don't have that to fall back on? And if you guys grew up anything like me, like there is no safety blanket. I can't hit up my mom and pops and be like, yo, I'm in a jam, like could you slot, you know, can you slip me a G? Like it's actually the opposite. It's actually, yo mom, I got you. I broke my mom off yesterday and I love that's my favorite time of the month <laughs> when I could break my parents off and I could make all the money in the world times 10 and then some and it still won't even be a fraction of what my parents did and I, and I know we all feel the same way in this room right so with that context set right the future of work is not only affecting our generation it's affecting our parents is going to compound on this generation so then where does that leave us where do we go? How do we connect the dots? So let me take you guys back. So my, my folks come from the Dominican Republic. We grew up in Wash Heights. We grew up really broke. We grew up below the poverty line, which means both my parents combined didn't make more than $30,000 a year. There was four of us living in a one bedroom apartment. How many of you guys have uh, my pops put up like a fake wall in the living room and turned that shit into a bedroom? And was like, all right, there's a bedroom. And it was my sister who had the, you know, the main bunk. And then it was a Sure, my sister had the main bed, and then it was a bunk bed, and then my oldest brother got the top bunk, which I always fucking wanted. <laughs> and then there was a bottom bunk, and I split the bottom bunk with the brother. So not only did I have the bottom bunk, but I split that bunk bed, that little twin bed, with a brother of mine. So that's the roots. After 9-11, my parents were like, yo, the city's wild. We went to Florida. And that's a common Dominican migrant trail. You move to, all oh, you guys are laughing. You guys probably live in Fort Lauderdale too, I bet. Um, you go to the Wash Heights, you go to Florida. But now, here's the interesting thing. It wasn't until when I was in Florida, right? My mom was a custodian. And so she, uh, one of the benefits that you get when working as a custodian is your kids can go to that school district even though you don't live in that neighborhood. And that was an interesting turning point in my life because I went to a high school that was very affluent, even though we lived in a poor neighborhood right outside. And for the first time, like when you grow up broke and everyone's broke, no big deal. When you're going to school where when you turn 16, like your homies are getting a brand new car, keys handed to them. And my, my boy was like, yo, come, come over to my crib. I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, not only did I need the ride there, but when we pull up, there's a giant gate and it opens and there's a little winding trail and shit opens up into an estate and we pull up into a home. He's like, yeah, this is the guest home. And he had a, you know, a three car garage with a home up top. And then there's a main home that has a tree house with a zip line. You take that shit all the way to the back <laughs> and it's got a pool with a disappearing edge and a, and a boat docked and the main home, like things I had never in my life seen. I, man. It just takes me back because there started, I started feeling this feeling of inadequacy. Like almost like actually like a bitterness is, and it breeded slowly because I was like, damn, why can't like, I get it, God, I get it. Like challenges make you stronger, but like I'm not trying to deal with challenges at this moment in time. <laughs> like I want to have a whip 
so I you know, could be mobile. I want to have a little bit of bread so I could go to the movies. Like, you know what I'm saying? I was into guitar and like I had, you know, the little beat up guitar and like my homies would just like anything that they wanted, they got on command. All I wanted was my own room. I always split a room, you know, like these were the, the things I was thinking about then. But but it's really interesting because. Right. That was the first time like I saw I got this chip on my shoulder like, yo, I want to do it different. And so when I graduated high school, I came back to the streets that made me. I came back to New York City. Because I said, yo, small town life isn't for me. And if there's anywhere where there's an enormous amount of opportunity compounded, it's right here. It's in New York City. And I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it somehow. I didn't know how or what. But like a lot of you in this room, right? Like, guys, it's 9 in the morning. You probably got up at 7. Some of you 6, depending on where you live, to get here. Like, that already tells me that, you know, you're trying to make something happen. And that could vary based on your ambition. Some of you, some of you guys are trying to be Jay-Z, right? And hit the billy. Some of you guys want to hold down a nice, comfortable job so you can have a family and what have you. It doesn't matter where you fall on that spectrum. It matters to me that you guys are here, right? So I came to that city with the same fire and I was working a bunch of dead end jobs. And I don't know, maybe a lot of, some of us can relate, but I didn't have skills. I didn't know how to code, how to design. Like I just, you know, I'm just out there working little dead end jobs. My dad worked at a press, you know, as a presser and a dry cleaner. So I was out there, I was a bag boy. And uh, you know, I was not that good because I was screwing up the deliveries and the lady sat me down and she's like, John, I think you know what this means. She was, and I was like, no. She was like, you're being fired. <laughs> so I got fired from that job. I worked a job as a leather sales, coat salesman, got fired from that job. I worked a job, how many of you guys heard of like network marketing, right? Like I did that, selling uh, knives, Cutco, fired from that. I mean, I was like, bro, I can't keep a job. I finally, my first decent job was a job as a doorman. And that was the other turning point in my life because here I was in Corbatao, you know what I'm saying, in a little suit. And I was like, all right, bet. Making, you know, 12, 12, 13 bucks an hour. I was young, I was 18. I was like, all right, cool. I can make something happen here. Guys, this is when it all changed for me. Opening up doors for people, open up doors for me. It's not about what you're doing, it's how you do it. My mom cleaned toilets for a living and always taught me, yo, son, do your job with pride. A lot of people would consider a doorman job a, a dead end job. And the other doorman had been there for years and didn't even learn the residents' names. They didn't learn their names. Now, we all come from the same place. Where we come from, you gotta be resourceful, right? We have street smarts. We have like, yo, we can tell who's watching. You have EQ, that's emotional intelligence, right? EQ is far more important than IQ. I know a lot of cats that are street smarts and just like have no common sense. So now I'm stepping in this world and I was like, wow, you guys don't know their names? Like, I'm gonna take your lunch money. I'm gonna do this way better than you, was the mindset, right? And so anyway, to fast forward so we can get into the meat of it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm walking you guys through the mindset, how I got there. When I got there, I was determined to do a really good job. I didn't care how you saw what I did. And one of the residents whom I'm going to go see after this was a full circle moment for me. Puerto Rican guy, fucking self-made, millionaire, wasn't shy about his money, drove a Beamer. And he looked at me, he's like, yo, don't you dare settle for being the doorman. You can have your own doorman. He did 19 years and he's like, yo, one thing you learn when you got nothing but time is the value of time. And he was like, yo, psst. you could, he showed me how to take something, an idea and turn it into your own stream of income. We're going to talk about the job landscape, but just know he taught me how to make my own job. So I didn't have to rely on an, on an outside system, right? So he had a franchise of dry cleaners. That's how he made his money. I don't know anything about dry cleaning, but he's like, yo, go around to Harlem, convince people to give you their clothes, 
right? Like, yo, yo, hey, how you doing? Hi, my name is John Henry. Hi, pleasure. Listen, uh, where do you get that shirt clean? It's nice. You, you probably spent 49 bucks on that. You know, you don't want to put it in the washer. So, you know, come, you know, leave it with me. I'll dry clean it to you for, you know, for three bucks. And, you know, have it's the next day delivery. I learned how to do this. And I would take the clothes, bring it to Hugo. He would clean it and he would do it for me for the cheap, a dollar, and I would bring it back. And so that was my first little hustle, right? And I built a little business going around, by the way, on the A train, I didn't have a whip. I was on the A train going to your apartment, picking up the clothes, bringing it to Hugo in Bushwick, which means I did have to take the L, cross over to the, the A to the L and, and so forth. And so anyway, eventually through a lot of hustle, I broke into the film industry. I started, I did all the wardrobe for my first movie was The Wolf of Wall Street. Every single piece of wardrobe that you saw on that film was processed by this guy. <laughs> this guy. Fucking, thank you. Thank you. But the trippy thing is, yo, I was 18 years old. I had dropped out of college. I dropped out of college my first semester. Here, being here takes me back. I was in school, I was like, yo, this is just not for me. This is not for me. I don't thrive in a structured environment. I don't like when someone tells me what to do. I don't like, like, I just don't like that shit. And I was like, yo, I need to create my own framework. So that's what, you know, so, so I realized, wow, I'm having success in business. We were talking about this on the way here with my videographer, Mendy, who's 6'5", you can't miss him. Um, but we were talking about it, it's like, yo, the world, the job world, everything is made to seem so technical. Oh, well, you got to know all the technical stuff. And we get scared of entering into something because we feel we don't know enough to break in. And I know because I did it, started with knowing nothing, that the most important thing is actually having the bravery to get started because most people don't. And so over time, I built the business, we did Boardwalk Empire, Law and Order, Person Adventures, White Collar, Amazing Spider-Man 2, Ninja Turtles, Spike Lee, Mike Tyson, Beyonce stuff, Barclay Center. We grew this business. All of a sudden, this young kid from the hood, Section 8, who split a bunk bed, who split a bunk bed, making 50 Gs a month now, at that time, I was like, whoa. Like, my mind was, was really open to what could be done. Fast forward, I sold that business, I took my cash, I started, getting into other things. I started investing a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm a part owner of a dental practice. I'm part owner of a cafe. I got into media. I invested in a media company called Blavity. I invested into hemp, CBD, because I tell you what, blacks and Latinos get disproportionately affected by incarceration for weed. How many of us know that someone that got locked up for simple possession of weed, and now that that's just legal and it's creating billions of dollars in revenue, all of a sudden, we're the ones who are not getting access? I'll be damned. I'll be damned. So invest in there. I started investing in real estate because I don't know about y'all, but there, has, there was a time when I was evicted from my apartment when I was on my hustle because I laid it all on the line, got behind on rent, found myself in a situation where I didn't know what to do, had to bounce, got back on my feet. I made enough bread to pay off my old rents. I went to that building and when I went to the building, I'll never forget what I saw. It was an operation, it was mostly Jewish operated, and I love the Jewish community because I think they've done a lot of things really well. But there was a line of folks who were there, and what did they have in common? All of color. And I was like, yo, how is it that a Jewish-owned company controls all the buildings in the hood? They don't live in the hood. That's where we live. And I realized, yo, we can't break out of this vicious cycle until we own some shit like Nipsey didn't die in vain. Like we gotta build equity. I'm not trying to look hood rich, I'm trying to make the hood rich. That site changed my life. I've begun investing in property. I've, I now I host a show on Viceland, that show is executive produced by Alicia Keys. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate you watching. That show is executive produced by Alicia Keys. When the year that I came here, I was singing New York. <laughs> Full circle. I'm like, yo, how does she want to produce a show about me? Like, why does Vice want to broadcast me internationally? We're in eight countries. I'm like, yo, you know, I, I run a fund now. It's a $25 million fund, and we only invest in women and minorities. Only. 
Like, I'm in now, I'm in positions of power, my young friends. And it's like, yo, it's not lost on me that just eight years ago, I was here in this room, wondering how I was gonna figure it out. Wondering like, where do I fit in, in all this changing landscape? And still to this day, I wonder, damn, how I still don't really fully understand how our perspective, right? How my perspective has come to grow to be so valuable that I'm paid, like I'm paid to be on TV. I do that shit for free. I've been paid to jump on a podcast. I'm paid to do YouTube videos. I'm paid to post on Instagram. Paid to travel. I could write a book if I want. I've now stepped into this world where I've cracked the code. I understand that if you produce something and bring it into the world, if enough people want it, you can get paid for it. And we're living in a time where there is so much change going on and change works to our benefit. Because guess what? The other day I had a company that we all know is a, is a big media company, I won't name it, but they gave me a call and they invited me in for a meeting. I was like, all right, cool, I go in for the meeting. I was like, hey, all right, well, um, you know, what do you guys wanna tell me? And they're like, no, John, we're here seeking your help. The industry is changing. We don't know how to reach young people. We've been around 50 years, but we're hoping you could share with us how it is that you're doing so well on Instagram. That was another moment where it sunk in. You mean to tell me established companies actually are experiencing so much change that they're losing their footing? Anytime there's a lot of change, that means there's a new wave. And I don't know about y'all, but in order to crush it, you have a much greater opportunity, unless you come from a last name or a zip code, which I don't, probably, I don't know if you guys do. But unless you come from a last name or a zip code, right, and you have those advantages, right, because like I grew up without health insurance. So guess what? Growing up, when I turned 18, I had no health insurance. You get sick, you go to the ER, I ain't paying that bill, that's how my mom taught me, and then you end up with bad credit, right? So we've been passed on bad credit, poor financial habits, no assets, and there is a world, I assure you, where kids do grow up with parents who have assets, have bread, have good credit, expose them to the right networks, bring them to Silicon Valley, to Lake Tahoe, to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, all these places. You can't be what you can't see, right? You can't be what you can't see. And so, um, you know, unless you come from all that, anytime there is incredible change, you can realize, yo, I can step in here and I could either A, make my own job, if you're like me and like really don't thrive in a structured environment, Right, that's self-awareness. I don't know if you're, if you're like that. I don't know if you're entrepreneurial. If you are, you can make, you can make your own lane. I'm gonna get to Q&A in a second. I see you waving me down. You can make your own lane in a new field. And also conversely, if you enjoy being part of a team, there is no better opportunity than to look to the very near future. I'm talking, what do you see that's in the next 12, 18, 24 months you see as being hot? Like go into that field because they don't have enough qualified folks doing the job. They don't have enough professionals. Like it's new. If something's been around only five years, it doesn't take that much knowledge to be one of the top players. So before I get into Q and A, what are some of the new spaces I'm seeing? Voice technology, right? Not, last year, the number one selling device, Q4, which is the last quarter of the holiday season was Echo Dot, Amazon Alexa. Why? Because they're slashing their prices, making it dirt cheap, BOGO, buy one, get one. You buying this, you get one of these. And they're putting these in every home. All of a sudden we have now an infrastructure across the entire nation of interconnected voice, voice driven devices. Podcasts have been on the rise, which tells me we are gradually shifting into a world where we're gonna be consuming more content passively, right? So what, what jobs exist in that field? Right? Could you learn you know, how to build products in the voice ecosystem? Can you learn, you know, um, shit, can you just learn customer service and like, learn how to fix broken Echo Dots and then go on Craigslist and say, we'll fix your Amazon Alexa? Right? Like, that's the kind of hustle I'm talking about. So media's changed, right? You no, longer, you no longer need a TV show to pop. So you, know, you have that, there's AIs, artificial intelligence, all kinds of fields that are popping and growing. And I want you guys to know that 
If you are resistant to this change, you will undoubtedly get left behind. Toys R Us, bankrupt. Radio Shack, same thing. Best Buy, same thing. It happens over and over and over. If you resist change, you will get left behind. So if you shift your sights to what's gonna pop off in the next two to three years, you don't, wanna, you don't need to be a futurist and think 50 years out. If that's your cup of tea, great. But in order to thrive and build a career for yourself and make a life uh, doing something exciting that you love, I love what I do. I, every day is different. You can build those careers in these new spaces. Um, so I wanna get into some Q&A. Um, and take some of your guys' questions before I wrap. How much time do we have, roughly? 10 minutes? OK, let's do a few questions. Who's got one? Throw your hands up. We don't have much time. Let's use the mic. So don't be shy. Don't be shy. We got one back there. We'll get to you. Hey, what's up, bro? How are you? Do you mind if I address the room? Go for it. Gotcha. Um, hello, everybody here. I just wanted to know that you guys are in the best position you could ever possibly be. I assume from the vibe I get that everybody here can go to vocational school, a youth program, or something similar to that. Um, the key thing that I took away from Mr. Henry's speech was the fact that there was one moment that he took advantage of. That moment was being a doorman, interacting with individuals. And um, I'm a little emotional myself because uh, the same thing happened to me. I was working retail for maybe like uh, almost two years. I had to leave college for financial reasons. And um, it didn't seem to go again anywhere, but uh, one day I was waiting for a friend in a uh, youth program. I was talking to the security guard. Just saying hi, just communicating. And I assume I uh, had an interview with one of the people there, and I completed an internship. Mr. Henry is an example of what can happen if you take advantage of situations like that. I hope that you all communicate with each other and really network it. This is this Thank you, bro. Thank you. Appreciate you. Call me John, by the way. Shit makes me feel old. <laughs> Mr. Henry. <laughs> My last name is Matos, by the way. A lot of people don't know that. John Henry Matos. Um, I go by JH because it, it rings. You know what I'm saying? What's up, bro? How are you? What, uh, speak up on the mic for me. Is this thing on? Hi, uh, my name is Dennis Vidal. Dennis, what's up, bro? Thank you, man. I'm also a Dominican American. There you go. Uh, I'm a college student, and I'm also learning how to code. Good. And do things like that. Good. Um, so, my question is, uh, what further impact are you specifically doing towards, like, the Dominican community, Dominican Americans, um, in that, like, you know, that community? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, look. I got, that, I got that question even when I was starting out. Like, I was just starting, people were like, well, what are you doing for our neighborhoods? I'm like, dude. <laughs> to quote Jay-Z, I know about y'all, but I grew up on hip hop. Hip hop is, that's kind of, it's a modern day scripture to me. There's a lot of depth in there. But Hov was like, yo, there's much bigger issues in the world, I know. But first I gotta take care of the world, I know. And so, my first responsibility and our first responsibility is really to crack the code for yourself. And once you do that, you know, like my first business, I wasn't changing the world. I was cleaning your dirty underwear. Like that was my business. And then I graduated, I was running an incubator in Harlem. And now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm controlling capital. I move money now, right? And like, and I invest only in women and minority founded companies because 97% of all money goes to white males. So, so, you know, w yet we make 70% of the US population, all women and all minorities combined. So I was like, yo, you mean to tell me 
only 3% of the money is going to 